Welcome to Through the Bible in a Year with Pastor John. We invite you to join us at 1 Oakley Avenue in North Providence, Rhode Island. This podcast is presented to you by The Way Ministries, supported by listeners like you. For donations, live videos, podcasts, and more, please visit www.thewayministriesri.org. Thank you and have a great day. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Through the Bible in a Year with Pastor John. Glad you could join me today to get a portion of God's Word. Today we're going to begin in Walk 15, January 15th, Joseph's brother in Egypt. Overview. During his imprisonment, Joseph gains a reputation as an accurate interpreter of dreams. He is now called upon to use his God-given ability to interpret the disturbing dreams of Pharaoh. Though the interpretation is ominous, Pharaoh's response is astounding. Joseph becomes prime minister of the land with power second only to Pharaoh himself. With the worldwide famine coming, Joseph becomes Pharaoh's administrator of a relief program to meet the challenge. His new position allows him to confront his brothers with the truth of their carefully concealed crime. Chapter 41, Joseph's Promotion, Faithfulness. Chapter 42, Jacob's Problem, Famine. Chapter 43, Benjamin's Visit, Fear. Chapter 44, Joseph's Vengeance, Confession. Insight, From Prison to Palace in a Day, Genesis 41 to 40. At the age of 17, Joseph was sold into Egyptian slavery. Chapter 37, verse 2 to 28. Thirteen years later, He rose from the depths of the royal prison, chapter 39, verse 20, to second in command of the entire nation, chapter 41, 46. When the time was right, God promoted him from the prison to the palace overnight, chapter 41, verses 14 to 40. That's an apt reminder that God's graduate school of growth is not fixed on a course schedule. Insight. Whatever happened to the tribe of Joseph? Joseph named his sons Manasseh and Ephraim, names that sound like the Hebrew terms forgotten and fruitful, because as he said, God's blessings made him forget his troubles, and he became fruitful in the land of his suffering. Chapter 41, verses 51 to 52. Jacob adopted and blessed both of Joseph's sons. Chapter 48, verse 5. Consequently, the descendants of Joseph later became two tribes of Israel, named for Joseph's two sons, and so Joseph's family inherited a double portion. Chapter 41, Pharaoh's Dreams Two full years later, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing on the bank of the Nile River. In his dream, he saw seven fat, healthy cows come up out of the river and begin grazing in the marsh grass. Then he saw seven more cows come up behind them from the Nile, but these were scrawny and thin. These cows stood beside the fat cows on the riverbank. Then the scrawny thin cows ate the seven healthy fat cows. At this point in the dream, Pharaoh woke up. But he fell asleep again, and he had a second dream. This time he saw seven heads of grain, plump and beautiful, growing on a single stalk. Then seven more heads of grain appeared, but these were shriveled and withered by the east wind. And these thin heads swallowed up the seven plump, well-formed heads. Then Pharaoh woke up again and realized it was a dream. The next morning, Pharaoh was very disturbed by the dreams, so he called for all the magicians and wise men of Egypt. When Pharaoh told them his dream, not one of them could tell him what they meant. Finally, the king's chief cupbearer spoke up. Today I've been reminded of my failure, he told Pharaoh. Some time ago you were angry with the chief baker and me, and you imprisoned us in the palace of the captain of the guard. One night, the chief baker and I each had a dream, and each dream had its own meaning. There was a young Hebrew man with us in the prison who was a slave to the captain of the guard. We told him our dreams, and he told us what each of our dreams meant, and everything happened just as he had predicted. I was restored to my position as cupbearer, and the chief baker was executed and impaled on a pole. 
Pharaoh sent for Joseph at once, and he was quickly brought from the prison. After he shaved and changed his clothes, he went and stood before Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream last night, and no one here can tell me what it means. But I have heard that when you hear about a dream, you can interpret it. It is beyond my power to do this, Joseph replied. But God can tell you what it means and set you at ease. So Pharaoh told Joseph his dream. In my dream, he said, I was standing on the bank of the Nile River, and I saw seven fat, healthy cows come up out of the river and begin grazing in the marsh grass. But then I saw seven sick-looking cows, scrawny and thin, come up after them. I've never seen such sorry-looking animals in all the land of Egypt. These thin, scrawny cows ate the seven fat cows, but afterward you wouldn't have known it, for they were still as thin and scrawny as before. Then I woke up. In my dream, I also saw seven heads of grain, full and beautiful, growing on a single stalk. Then seven more heads of grain appeared, but these were blighted, shriveled, and withered by the east wind. And the shriveled heads swallowed the seven healthy heads. I told these dreams to the magicians, but no one could tell me what they mean. Joseph responded, Both of Pharaoh's dreams mean the same thing. God is telling Pharaoh in advance what he is about to do. The seven healthy cows and the seven healthy heads of grain both represent seven years of prosperity. The seven thin scrawny cows that came up later and the seven thin heads of grain withered by the east wind represent seven years of famine. This will happen just as I have described it, for God has revealed to Pharaoh in advance what he is about to do. The next seven years will be a period of great prosperity throughout the land of Egypt. But afterward, there will be seven years of famine so great that all the prosperity will be forgotten in Egypt. Famine will destroy the land. This famine will be so severe that even the memory of the good years will be erased. As for having two similar dreams, it means that these events have been decreed by God, and he will soon make them happen. Therefore, Pharaoh should find an intelligent and wise man and put him in charge of the entire land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh should appoint supervisors over the land and let them collect one-fifth of all the crops during the seven good years. Have them gather all the food produced in the good years that are just ahead and bring it to Pharaoh's storehouses. Store it away and guard it so there will be food in the cities. That way, there will be enough to eat when the seven years of famine come to the land of Egypt. Otherwise, this famine will destroy the land. Joseph made ruler of Egypt. Joseph's suggestions were well received by Pharaoh and his officials. So Pharaoh asked his officials, Can we find anyone else like this man so obviously filled with the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has revealed the meaning of the dreams to you, clearly no one else is as intelligent or wise as you are. You will be in charge of my court, and all my people will take orders from you. Only I, sitting on my throne, will have a rank higher than yours. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the entire land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh removed his signet ring from his hand and placed it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in fine linen clothing and hung a gold chain around his neck. Then he had Joseph ride in the chariot reserved for his second in command. And wherever Joseph went, the command was shouted, Kneel down. So Pharaoh put Joseph in charge of all Egypt. And Pharaoh said to him, I am Pharaoh, but no one will lift a hand or foot in the entire land of Egypt without your approval. Then Pharaoh gave Joseph a new Egyptian name, Zaphaneta Pania. He also gave him a wife whose name was Asenet. She was the daughter of Potiphera, the priest of An. So Joseph took charge of the entire land of Egypt. He was 30 years old when he began serving in the court of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And when Joseph left Pharaoh's presence, he inspected the entire land of Egypt. As predicted, for seven years, the land produced bumper crops. During those years, Joseph gathered all the crops grown in Egypt and stored the grain from the surrounding fields and the cities. He piled up huge amounts of grain like sand on the seashore. 
Finally, he stopped keeping records because there was too much to measure. During this time, before the first of the famine years, two sons were born to Joseph and his wife. Asenath, the daughter of Potipharah, the priest of An, Joseph named his oldest son Manasseh, for he said, God has made me forget all my troubles and everyone in my father's family. Joseph named the second son Ephraim, for he said, God has made me fruitful in this land of my grief. At last, the seven years of bumper crops throughout the land of Egypt came to an end. Then the seven years of famine began, just as Joseph has predicted. The famine also struck all the surrounding countries, but throughout Egypt there was plenty of food. Eventually, however, the famine spread throughout the land of Egypt as well, and the people cried out to Pharaoh for food. He told them, go to Joseph and do whatever he tells you. So with severe famine everywhere, Joseph opened up all the storehouses and distributed grain to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe throughout the land of Egypt. And people from all around came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe throughout the world. Genesis 42 Joseph's brothers go to Egypt. When Jacob heard that grain was available in Egypt, he said to his sons, Why are you standing around looking at one another? I have heard there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy enough grain to keep us alive, otherwise we'll die. So Joseph's ten older brothers went down to Egypt to buy grain. But Jacob wouldn't let Joseph's younger brother Benjamin go with them, for fear some harm might come to him. So Jacob's son arrived in Egypt along with others to buy food for the famine was in Canaan as well. Since Joseph was governor of all Egypt and in charge of selling grain to all the people, it was to him that his brothers came. When they arrived, they bowed before him with their faces to the ground. Joseph recognized his brothers instantly, but he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where are you from? he demanded. From the land of Canaan, they replied. We have come to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they didn't recognize him. And he remembered the dreams he had about them many years before. He said to them, You are spies. You have come to see how vulnerable our land has become. No, my lord, they exclaimed. Your servants have simply come to buy food. We are all brothers, members of the same family. We are honest men, sir. We are not spies. Yes, you are, Joseph insisted. You have come to see how vulnerable our land has become. Sir, they said, there are actually twelve of us. We, your servants, are all brothers, sons of a man living in the land of Canaan. Our youngest brother is back there with our father right now, and one of our brothers is no longer with us. But Joseph insisted, as I said, you are spies. This is how I will test your story. I swear by the life of Pharaoh, that you will never leave Egypt unless your youngest brother comes here. One of you must go and get your brother. I'll keep the rest of you here in prison. Then we'll find out whether or not your story is true. By the life of Pharaoh, if it turns out that you don't have a younger brother, then I'll know you are spies. So Joseph put them all in prison for three days. On the third day, Joseph said to them, I am a God-fearing man. If you do as I say, you will live. If you really are honest men, choose one of your brothers to remain in prison. The rest of you may go home with grain for your starving families. But you must bring your youngest brother back to me. This will prove that you are telling the truth, and you will not die. To this they agreed. Speaking among themselves, they said, Clearly we are being punished because of what we did to Joseph long ago. We saw his anguish when he pleaded for his life, but we wouldn't listen. That's why we are in this trouble. Didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? Reuben asked. But you wouldn't listen, and now we have to answer for his blood. Of course they didn't know that Joseph understood them, for he had been speaking to them through an interpreter. Now he turned away from them and began to weep. When he regained his composure, he spoke to them again. Then he chose Simeon from among them and had him tied up right before their eyes. Joseph then ordered his servants to fill the men's sacks with grain, but he also gave secret instructions to return each brother's payment at the top of his sack. 
He also gave them supplies for their journey home. So the brothers loaded their donkeys with the grain and headed for home. But when they stopped for the night, and one of them opened his sack to get grain for his donkey, he found his money in the top of his sack. Look, he exclaimed to his brothers, my money has been returned. It is here in my sack. Then their hearts sank. Trembling, they said to each other, What has God done to us? When the brothers came to their father, Jacob in the land of Canaan, they told him everything that had happened to them. The man who was governor of the land spoke very harshly to us, they told him. He accused us of being spies, scouting the land. But we said we are honest men, not spies. We are twelve brothers, sons of one father. One brother is no longer with us, and the youngest is at home with our father in the land of Canaan. Then the man who was governor of the land told us, This is how we will find out if you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers here with me, and take grain for your starving families, and go on home. But you must bring your youngest brother back to me. Then I will know you are honest men and not spies. Then I will give you back your brother, and you may trade freely in the land. As they emptied out their sacks, there in each man's sack was the bag of money they had paid for the grain. The brothers and their father were terrified when they saw the bags of money. Jacob exclaimed, You are robbing me of my children. Joseph is gone. Simeon is gone. And now you want to take Benjamin too. Everything is going against me. Then Reuben said to his father, You may kill my two sons if I don't bring Benjamin back to you. I'll be responsible for him, and I promise to bring him back. But Jacob replied, My son will not go down with you. His brother Joseph is dead, and he is all I have left. If anything should happen to him on your journey, you would send this grieving white-haired man to his grave. Chapter 43 The Brothers Return to Egypt But the famine continued to ravage the land of Canaan. When the grain they had bought from Egypt was almost gone, Jacob said to his sons, Go back and buy us a little more food. But Judah said, The man was serious when he warned us, You won't see my face again unless your brother is with you. If you send Benjamin with us, we will go down and buy more food. But if you don't let Benjamin go, we won't go either. Remember, the man said, You won't see my face again unless your brother is with you. Why were you so cruel to me? Jacob moaned. Why did you tell him you had another brother? The man kept asking us questions about our family, they replied. He asked, Is your father still alive? Do you have another brother? So he answered his questions. How could we know he would say, Bring your brothers down here? Judah said to his father, Send the boy with me and we will be on our way. Otherwise, we will all die of starvation, and not only we, but you and our little ones. I personally guarantee his safety. You may hold me responsible if I don't bring him back to you. Then let me bear the blame forever. If we hadn't wasted all this time, we could have gone and returned twice by now. So their father Jacob finally said to them, If it can't be avoided, then at least do this. Pack your bags with the best products of this land. Take them down to the man as gifts, balm, honey, gum, aromatic resin, pistachio nuts, and almonds. Also, take double the money that was put back in your sacks, as it was probably someone's mistake. Then take your brother and go back to the man. May God Almighty give you mercy as you go before the man, so that he will release Simeon and let Benjamin return. But if I must lose my children, so be it. So the men packed Jacob's gift and doubled the money and headed off with Benjamin. They finally arrived in Egypt and presented themselves to Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the manager of the household, These men will eat with me this noon. Take them inside the palace, then go slaughter an animal and prepare a big feast. So the man did as Joseph told him and took them into Joseph's palace. The brothers were terrified when they saw that they were being taken into Joseph's house. It's because of the money someone put in our sacks last time we were here, they said. He plans to pretend that we stole it. Then he will seize us, make us slaves, and take our donkeys. A feast at Joseph's palace. The brothers approached the manager of Joseph's household and spoke to him at the entrance to the palace. Sir, they said, 
We came to Egypt once before to buy food, but as we were returning home, we stopped for the night and opened our sacks. Then we discovered that each man's money, the exact amount paid, was in the top of his sack. Here it is. We have brought it back with us. We also have additional money to buy more food. We have no idea who put our money in our sacks. Relax, don't be afraid, the household manager told them. Your God, the God of your father, must have put this treasure into your sacks. I know I received your payment. Then he released Simeon and brought him out to them. The manager then led the men into Joseph's palace. He gave them water to wash their feet and provide food for their donkeys. They were told they would be eating there. So they prepared their gifts for Joseph's arrival at noon. When Joseph came home, they gave him the gifts they had brought him, then bowed low to the ground before him. After greeting them, he asked, How is your father, the old man you spoke about? Is he still alive? Yes, they replied, Our father, your servant, is alive and well. And they bowed low again. Then Joseph looked at his brother Benjamin, the son of his own mother. Is your youngest brother the one you told me about? Joseph asked, May God be gracious to you, my son. Then Joseph hurried from the room because he was overcome with emotion for his brother. He went into his private room where he broke down and wept. After washing his face, he came back out, keeping himself under control. Then he ordered, Bring out the food. The waiters served Joseph at his own table, and his brothers were served at a separate table. The Egyptians who ate with Joseph sat at their own table because... Egyptians despised Hebrews and refused to eat with them. Joseph told each of his brothers where to sit, and to their amazement he seated them according to age from oldest to youngest. And Joseph filled their plates with food from his own table, giving Benjamin five times as much as he gave the others. So they feasted and drank freely with him. Chapter 44 Joseph's Silver Cup When his brothers were ready to leave, Joseph gave these instructions to his palace manager. Fill each of their sacks with as much grain as they can carry and put each man's money back into his sack. Then put my personal silver cup at the top of the younger brother's sack, along with the money for his grain. So the manager did as Joseph instructed him. The brothers were up at dawn and were sent on their journey with their loaded donkeys. But when they had gone only a short distance and were barely out of the city, Joseph said to his palace manager, Chase after them and stop them. When you catch up with them, ask them, Why have you repaid my kindness with such evil? Why have you stolen my master's silver cup, which he uses to predict the future? What a wicked thing you have done. When the palace manager caught up with the men, he spoke to them as he had been instructed. What are you talking about? The brothers responded. We are your servants and would never do such a thing. Didn't we return the money we found in our sacks? We brought it back all the way from the land of Canaan. Why would we steal silver or gold from your master's house? If you find this cup with any one of us, let that man die, and all the rest of us, my lord, will be your slaves. That's fair, the man replied. But only the one who stole the cup will be my slave. The rest of you may go free. They all quickly took their sacks from the backs of the donkeys and opened them. The palace manager searched the brothers' sacks from the oldest to the youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. When the brothers saw this, they tore their clothing in despair. Then they loaded their donkeys again and returned to the city. Joseph was still in his palace when Judah and his brothers arrived, and they fell to the ground before him. What have you done, Joseph demanded. Don't you know that a man like me can predict the future? Judah answered, Oh, my Lord, what can we say to you? How can we explain this? How can we prove our innocence? God is punishing us for our sins. My Lord, we have all returned to be your slaves, all of us, not just our brother who had your cup in his sack. No, Joseph said, I would never do such a thing. Only the man who stole the cup will be my slave. The rest of you may go back to your father in peace. Judah speaks for his brothers. Then Judah stepped forward and said, Please, my lord, let your servant say just one word to you. Please do not be angry with me, even though you are as powerful as Pharaoh himself. My lord, previously you asked us, your servants, 
do you have a father or brother? And we responded, yes, my Lord, we have a father who is an old man and his youngest son is a child of his old age. His full brother is dead and he alone has left his mother's children and his father loves him very much. And you said to us, bring him here so I can see with my own eyes. But we said to you, my Lord, the boy cannot leave his father for his father would die. But you told us, unless your youngest brother comes with you, you will never see my face again. So we returned to your servant, our father, and told him what you said. Later, when he said, go back again and buy us more food, we replied, we can't go unless you let our youngest brother go with us. We'll never get to see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Then my father said to us, as you know, my wife has two sons, and one of them went away and never returned. Doubtless, he was torn to pieces by some wild animal. I have never seen him since. Now if you take his brother away from me, and any harm comes to him, you will send this grieving white-haired man to his grave. And now, my lord, I cannot go back to my father without the boy. Our father's life is bound up in the boy's life. If he sees that the boy is not with us, our father will die. We, your servants, will indeed be responsible for sending that grieving white-haired man to his grave. My lord, I guarantee to my father I would take care of the boy. I told him, if I don't bring him back to you, I will bear the blame forever. So please, my lord, let me stay here as a slave instead of the boy, and let the boy return with his brothers, for how can I return to my father if the boy is not with me? I couldn't bear to see anguish. This would cause my father. My Daily Walk There are many skills you can learn in an afternoon, such as how to change the oil in your car or bake a batch of cookies. Other skills take longer to master, how to sing harmony or drive a car, for instance. And then there are skills like how to work with others that will hone and develop for the rest of our lives. Perhaps the most important of these is how to draw upon God's promises, even when the circumstances don't look promising. Thirteen years of Joseph's life was spent in obscurity in Egypt, but they were not wasted years. God in his infinite wisdom knew that the man who emerged in chapter 41 would be different from the man who was submerged in chapter 37. It takes a world with trouble in it to train men and women for their high calling as children of God. Faced with trouble, some people grow wings, others buy crutches. What kind are you? Read Isaiah 40.31, and wherever you encounter the word they, substitute your own name. It's a promise aimed at you. It is possible to learn from an enemy things we can't learn from a friend. That's all for today, folks. It was great meeting with you. God bless and have a great day, and I will see you tomorrow.